Data graphics should clarify information and support analytical thinking about evidence. But that goal, although it constrains one's options, does not in and of itself dictate the form a graphic should take. Effective communication of any kind, including effective communication through visualization, should always place the receiver of the information, in this case the perceiver of the graphics, front and center. To do that, we need lessons from research on perception for design of data visualizations. Reality is not always what we perceive. That sounds like a prompt for an essay question in Philosophy 101, but it is a simple fact of visual perception. The rich body of research on vision and perception is of more than academic interest. Its lessons are essential to the design of effective graphics. The idea that our sense of vision is WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, is easily debunked by optical illusions. They attest to the mysteries of visual perception. Great designs can tap into the same optical mechanisms that generate the illusion part of the optical illusion. In an oversimplified analogy, the eye is said to behave like a camera. In a camera, light enters through an aperture, similar to the pupil of the eye, the size of which is controlled by a diaphragm, like the iris. The lens focuses the light onto the back of the camera or the retina of the eye. Whether the camera is film or digital, it is designed to record a replica of the visual scene. In the retina, the receptors, rods and cones, also record the visual scene, changing or transducing light energy into electrical signals that are sent to the brain. But this is where the eye-camera analogy breaks down for two reasons. First, the brain does not receive many images from the retina. The visual scene is divided into parts and sent to different regions of the brain. Form, color, location, and movement are not analyzed by one hierarchical neural system, but by multiple parallel pathways in the brain. For example, in a set of classic experiments, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel discovered cells in the primary visual cortex that respond to lines with specific orientations. One cell might respond to a horizontal line, while another responds to a line tilted 20 degrees from horizontal. Higher regions of the brain then resynthesize the image from these separately analyzed pieces. The second reason that the eye-camera analogy breaks down is that the brain does not simply passively record the information it receives. It actively tries to make sense of it, and it uses information from memory to do so. In other words, the flow of information is not unidirectional from eyes to brain, information also flows in the opposite direction. Prior experience influences what we see. Our propensity to see optical illusions arises because vision is a synthetic sense. It puts information together. For example, if two wavelengths or colors of light are mixed, we perceive an intermediary color, not the two component colors. Red plus blue is seen as purple. This seems so natural as to be obvious. But consider the sense of hearing. If a high and a low sound are played simultaneously, we hear both sounds, not an inter intermediary sound. Lessons from neuroscience therefore tell us much about why we see what we do, but admittedly it is difficult to directly apply neuroscience research to graphic design. Research in psychology is easier to apply to designing visualizations. Particularly useful lessons come from a theory of perception known as Gestalt psychology. Its basic premise is that in perception, the whole is greater than the sum of parts. In other words, although we can analyze the individual elements in a scene, doing so is not sufficient to allow us to understand visual perception, because the relations between different elements in a scene helps determine what we see. The Gestalt principle of similarity states that similar elements are seen as belonging to the same form. For instance, in this drawing, the diamond of x's inside the square of dots is easy to see. According to the principle of proximity, the elements that are closest to each other are perceived as belonging together. In these two sets of dots, it is the spacing that determines whether you see vertical stripes or horizontal stripes. The principle of closure states that our perceptual systems often supply missing information to close a figure and separate it from background. In the first figure, we perceive a triangle, even though the border is broken. In the second, we perceive two overlapping triangles, although their presence is an illusion. Good continuation refers to predictability and simplicity, our tendency to group lines and curves that follow a smooth, established direction rather than a sharp turn. It helps us distinguish two objects from one another when they intersect. The principle of good form determines how we perceive the relative location of objects. The figure with the simplest, uninterrupted border is perceived as being closer. The final Gestalt principle of organization, common fate, 
states that elements will move in, that move in the same direction, like a flock of birds or a partially hidden predator, will be perceived as belonging together. The principles of Gestalt psychology are readily applicable to the design of visualizations. For example, the use of the layout to focus the attention of the learner through a series of concepts. But they're not the only factors to consider. Another relevant body of research in psychology and education relates to cognitive load. The term cognitive load refers to the amount of memory and processing power needed to make sense of an explanation or visualization. If the cognitive load is too high, it may overwhelm the learner. But what determines the cognitive load imposed by a design? To estimate the cognitive load, one can examine a design along six different facets or dimensions. These are adapted from Alberto Cairo's visualization wheel. Is it concrete or is it abstract? A design may be concrete in that it is meant to mimic reality, or it may be more abstract in that it is meant to represent underlying concepts without actually physically resembling the thing it represents. Not all abstractions increase cognitive load. A well-designed diagram can be easier to grasp than a pictorial representation of the same thing. Is it familiar or original? Some graphical forms, such as bar graphs, are widespread and familiar but data sets may be better represented by more novel graphical forms that allow one to see interesting things in the data, but also impose a greater cognitive load. Is it information light or dense? The density is the amount of information compressed into a given amount of space. Light or dense graphics can both be informative, but of course more time is needed to make sense of a dense graphic. Is it unidimensional or multidimensional? This refers to the number of layers of depth a graphic permits one to explore. A multidimensional graphic allows a viewer to dig into the data. This is particularly relevant to interactive graphics, but also applies to static displays. Is it redundant or non-redundant? Just as saying the same thing over and over can bore a listener, depicting the same things over and over can bore a viewer. But strategic redundancy can be useful. Sometimes one needs to see things more than one way before they make sense. Is it unadorned or decorated? This last dimension is the most debated, with some designers eschewing ornamentation of any kind. Although an overly flashy design is distracting, the idea that one should avoid any visual element that does not directly enhance the understandability of one's graphics ignores the fact that we are not merely cognitive creatures. Emotion also plays a key role in how we attend to and process information. For example, some studies comparing people's responses to plain and ornamented versions of the same data display found that in some cases, ornamentation could enhance the long-term memory of the information. These different facets of a design do not operate independently of one another. For example, if one is using an original way to display data, it may be helpful to incorporate some redundancy in a design to help people navigate the unfamiliar graphical form. The cognitive load depends on the design of the graphic, but of course it also depends on the audience. The difference between novices and experts in any field is experts' ability to recognize patterns specific to that field. So for instance, a chess expert can look at a snapshot of the chessboard of a game in progress and memorize the positions of the pieces much more readily than can someone who does not play chess. That's because the expert recognizes the patterns and uses them to more quickly make sense of what is going on. For the expert, essentially, there are fewer things to remember because things can be grouped. This is highly relevant to communicating research to people outside your field. Details that you and your colleagues take for granted are details that can overwhelm a novice. Therefore, to tailor a presentation for a particular audience, take the cognitive load into consideration. How many new things are you throwing at the audience all at once? Finally, the cognitive load is not only dependent on the graphic and the audience. It is also dependent on the situation, or more specifically, time. That information-dense journal figure you slaved over to get just right it may be perfect for your peer-reviewed publication, particularly if journal real estate is limited. But show it on a slide for just 20 seconds during a presentation, and even your closest colleagues may be overwhelmed. Research on perception thus has many useful lessons for any kind of visual communication. Vision being a synthetic sense, what we see is dependent on the gestalt principles of similarity, proximity, closure, good continuation, good form, and common fate. Because vision and memory are intertwined, both cognitive and emotional factors can influence perception. Perception depends on the availability of working memory, which depends on the cognitive load imposed by a design, which is in turn dependent on its level of abstraction, familiarity, density, dimensionality, redundancy, 
and adornment. But cognitive load also depends on the audience and the context. Good graphic design takes training and practice, but these key concepts from research on perception and learning provide a solid foundation on which to build.